Hi, Michael. I'm <laughs> so happy you're here. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so well, <Hello> everyone. <laughs> this is Michael Zavros, everyone. <laughs> and I, I have this little bio thing. I will read it just in case someone here um, doesn't know Michael's biography. If he's, of course, a leading Australian artist whose work has been exhibited in major museums throughout Australia, New Zealand, Asia, and Europe. He's had multiple residencies overseas in Milan. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and he graduated from Queensland College of Art with a Bachelor of Visual Arts in 1996. Mm -hmm. And in my note here, I've known for his extraordinary technical prowess, <laughs> you know, like a cat. Anyway, I think it's true. And actually, it's funny, it's great to see you here because I've just mentioned you many times oh, in good. the talk I just gave. Um, and, you know, of course, there's the wonderful exhibition, The Favourite, if you haven't seen it, make sure you go and see it. Um, it's on display until October 2nd this year. And Michael, one of the things I started the whole talk with was, I mentioned the Archibald Prize, and of course, there's this exhibition on the Gold Coast right now. Um, uh, I keep saying Hota or Hata. Anyway, we had some discussion about whether it's Hota or Hata, <laughs> but Archie 100 is up there right now. And of course, you've been, You've entered the Archibald Prize, I think, five times. Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. it five or six? Five, five or six. Five yeah. or six times. So he knows a thing or two about portraiture, everybody, <laughs> and self portraiture. Um, <clears throat> I was reflecting on my way over here about how the last time you and I met was when the Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibition was here. If everyone remembers Masterpieces from the Met. And mm -hmm. we did a session. This is like just deja vu, right? <laughs> yeah, it was exactly <laughs> last time we saw each other. Yeah. And I was reflecting on how, um, so those paintings from the Met were in there and now your paintings <laughs> are in the very <laughs> site that they were in. Hmm. I think, and on that occasion, we talked a lot about Caravaggio and technique and so on and so forth. But I think I just wanted to start by asking you just the general feeling right now with the favorite up and what it's been like sort of, you know, unfurling all these public programs and just how are you feeling about the favorite right now? And has oh, it been a wild um, ride and kind it, of... It has been, it has been a wild ride. It's been, um, it's been a very big project to yeah. put together and I'm a bit of a control freak. So I've been very involved with, with the curating. I've worked very closely with Peter for, for three years and work closely with design. I mean, we do such incredible design. I say we, <laughs> Queenslander, but at, Goma does incredible design. So I mean, the, the way that space has transformed itself from say the Met Show to, yeah. to sort of house my practice so beautifully, it just, it, it, the space has transformed so beautifully. I work closely with Grace, who, um, Grace Lou, who's, who's an amazing designer. Um, making new projects like that, like the drown work, things that I haven't done before and collaborating so much. It's just, it has been big and exhausting yeah. and exciting. So, you know, when, it, when great things are happening, you're kind of fueled by it, but it's, um, it's been exhausting. So were you involved in the curatorial process from day one, yeah. basically, with yeah. Peter yeah. McKay, who's yeah. the curator of the show? Yeah, so we s sort of formulated a wish list and just going through years of practice and um, and then obviously what we could what we could get hold of um, and, and whittled it down, obviously space considerations yeah. and 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 his curating obviously comes yes. into it as well, what, what he wanted to present. Yes, and there's been plenty of like public engaged, so I know you're doing a session where you paint with, you come paint with Michael, have dinner with <laughs> that, Michael. That's a, that's a QCA Enjoy. one, that one. What's that? That's a QCA one, that one. Oh, okay. It's a QCA masterclass. But, but that's fabulous. Has it been, I mean, to have all your work together like that, you know, mm -hmm. take over that Quagoma space, and then has it been, as you anticipated, has it sort of felt... Like, I mean, this is 25 years yeah. of practice. You know, your graduation date was 96. It's unusual <laughs> things emerge, you know. Yeah. You, you throw all your practice together and, you know, I look at early bodies of work and I would have talked about, you know, I made these works for these reasons and did artist talks or made artist statements and, yeah. um, and they were talked about in this way at that time. And then you look at them 25 years later and the world has changed and maybe we talk about we use a word like white male privilege in a way that we maybe didn't 25 years ago. And there's all or sorts of things, culture, or cancel culture. Or, yeah. There's all sorts of things that happen around the work. And so, 
you throw them all together, they speak to each other differently, they speak in a different world, and I, I find that fascinating to, yeah. to encounter myself. Do you spend a lot of time reading reviews? Or have, have there, you know, not, or is it less of time? I, yeah. I, um, th there's been a lot, a lot of media for, for this, yes. and um, some some positive, and there's been some some negative writing yeah. as well. And I I don't I don't dwell on too much on either. I kind of get the gist of it. I don't even read all of it. Yeah. Um, I, I look for a big reproduction. That's excellent. <laughs> Hopefully, a cover. <laughs> And you That's have a it. candle. It's so great. <laughs> or a the, candle. You can buy a Michael Zavros <laughs> candle with your portrait, like your self-portrait. Set it on You're fire. so perfect for this session. It's just, it's just fantastic. And I really am getting this weird deja vu because of how we did this. All we were those talking too much, pre weren't we? Pre-pandemic. <laughs> I know. And I was thinking about how when we did that session, your experimentation with the mannequin had sort of just started. Mm -hmm. I was thinking what a gift it is that you have this fabulous body of work surrounding the dad mannequin as an outcome of the pandemic. And I was thinking about, I was like, what's my outcome from pandemic? It's like <laughs> grumpy online recorded lectures. <laughs> like, but you have this gorgeous... I think they're, they're connected. Grumpy. <laughs> All right, well, let's look at some art together because... Um, so I was telling Michael, you know, what we've been doing in the session this morning is thinking through um, sartorial power and the power of dress. And I have to say, for me, when I saw... Because I think we talked about this last time too, but for me, I was surprised by how small this one was mm -hmm. actually. When I went in and you've got that sort of fabulous collage, which is, so this is sort of your early practice. Mm -hmm. And I think reflecting here would be a really great place to start given what we've just been working through. Um, there was one point where I think you call these like portraits without a likeness. And mm -hmm. I, I, I know everyone would love to hear more about your reflections on this particular work at this juncture and, you know, given how much has happened subsequent in your practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, this work, um, Trinity, I did a, a tiny version of yeah. it and a really big one. The big one is, is oh, here, um, is owned by, owned by, by Goma. It's not up, but it was above the, the, um, the escalators for a while. So we oh, were yeah. running out of space. We thought we right. want to click. <laughs> um, this one was gifted actually by Wen Shu, but she had it for a little while, but, yeah. um, the early works were fairly standard fashion images, you know, yeah. that I would find in a magazine. And, and, and I think lots of people have heard this story, but I pulled this, ma this, this image out of what I wanted to wear to my wedding and it's just floating around on the desk and it, it's a fairly standard fashion image for it to be cropped in this way. But I sort of thought it's going to be interesting to paint it and it'll, all of these other things will, will happen in that transference from, yeah. from the page to, to, you know, a board or to an artwork or yes. on a wall. Um, and I think, yes, you start to read them very differently as these, you know, disconnected portraits, as portraits yes. without a subject, among other things. Um, and then later with a work like this, for example, I start to crop them myself from, from those first images. I start to manipulate them and yeah. make them speak in different ways and maybe making uh, religious analogies and and playing with that sartorial power and that mm -hmm. sense of, of wonder and awe and all of that stuff that was imbued with those works, you know, hundreds of years ago and, and trying to pull that out of these, these shoots that I would find in, in GQ or, or Esquire. Yeah. One of the artists I talked about in the session was Albrecht Dürer and his amazing self-portraits mm -hmm. and that whole idea of an artist painting themselves, not just in self-portraits, but every time they paint. You know, mm -hmm. it's a proverb. It gets taken up in Renaissance um, um, theory. And I just wondered your thoughts on that. Do you, do you feel... Because for me, when I look at your interiors and different elements that are together in that show, even this, like, this idea of an artist painting themselves feels mm -hmm. very powerful, like a thread almost through your practice. And I don't know yeah. if you see no, it that No, absolutely. Way too. And it was, often I'll read something by, by a critic or, or in a review and I think, yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think that is something that, that I haven't articulated before. And, um, and, and Robert Leonard writes a lot about yes. my work and I think he was probably the first person to say he, he makes self-portraiture every time he makes something and he makes surrogates. Yes. for himself, whether they're his kids or they're something else. Um, and I think he's right to the a point. The idea of a surrogate is completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And we think about, again, I mean, quickly, I just realised there was something I wanted to ask about the previous point, which is this idea of 
when do you, Michael, decide to move from photograph to paint? Because not, you know, you've got photographs in the show. Mm-hmm. How do you just dis- decide when it gets the Zavros paint job? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, when does that? <laughs> and because some instances, I mean, the photographs are spectacular. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the previous slide, I was working from found images. Yeah. So loving photography and, and coming from that picture generation and learning my mm-hmm. craft from that simple appropriation and sort of adding meaning or subtracting meaning or shifting meaning just by manipulating a thing that I've found. But I, I guess I learned my craft looking at that stuff, mm. learned how to um, compose a thing, how to kind of value add in that marketing way constantly in my practice. And so when I start shooting things, when I around 2006, 2005, 2006, I started to really broaden what I was doing. I was a bit um, dissatisfied with earlier work and thought I want to stretch that creative process myself mm. before it becomes a painting. So trying to make the thing that I would then paint or started to sculpt, I started to do a whole lot of things. Um, and taking my own photographs around that time. And technology was changing a yeah. lot around that time so that you could get an SLR that was digital and it was you could you could do amazing things without um, w- without a dark room suddenly. And yeah. just that, between that and Photoshop, you know, I was able to collage these things. And so photography started to become a much bigger part of my practice. And just learning from photographers who would come and document my work or come and shoot me for something which started to happen a lot and so I would ask these questions and learn a lot about this craft and um, at some point mostly I was shooting to as you say paint and then at some point I, I felt very it, it was a sort of a brave step for a painter to actually just show the photograph um, but what was interesting about that is that the works the first one was homework, which I think we're going to look at later, and then within a year, this these works, these these works with Sean O'Pray. But mm. um, it was interesting how the photography got suddenly got curated a lot more, and it found its way onto make journal covers and things. Curators like them better as photographs. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? I mean. Um, I don't know. I was talking about. I did talk here last night. We were talking about yeah. how that 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 magic that Vasari talks about in the 16th century. You know, he's just sort of had that these people who could paint something realistically and make something manifest. Like, ta-da! Here it is. It, it, it is rejected in a, in a in, in a lot of contemporary contexts. Yeah. You know, we learn this at art school that these, this skill set is not going to get you. It's, it's not in and of itself a thing anymore, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're out of a job and, and you need to find a way to make that relevant. So I've, I've found that an interesting process in, in my practice. We just spent an hour looking at <laughs> hyper-realistic yeah, yeah. and like, you know. And t- <laughs> I should have done art history. <laughs> <laughs> you still can. I still can. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I think you're, you're pretty busy. Um, I'll come along with Phoebe. I think she's, gonna, she's booking in. Oh, really? <laughs> I believe so. Oh, wow. Oh, his daughter. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be a question at one point, is if your children, given how prominently they feature in your practice, mm-hmm. if they're budding artists as well. And, mm-hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, the hyper-realism. So, of course, here, you know, here's my copy of the catalog. I've been very, very carefully. It's full of, like, posted. And, like, I mean, I think this was – I don't know if you were part of the decision to put this on the cover, but it's an inspired mm-hmm. – it just looks fabulous. And that kind of – so we, you know, the Angra portrait we looked at of Napoleon, where it was just, you know, the rug, like the little details and how, I mean, Michael's practice is just so breathtakingly, like, you know, the illusionism, the um, capacity, the technical prowess, as I said at the beginning. Um, I know I sound like I'm gushing. I am. Um, it's okay. I, I like that kind of criticism, but, but too. But it is interesting to talk about it. You know, in, in relation to a work like this, I mean, it's yeah. this mythical phoenix. It's magical. Yeah. It's sort of it's reveling in that that kind of mm. corny magic that I'm talking about. It's really saying, "Look, this is a flex, and yeah. l- look what I can do." Ta-da. Yes, and, I and love, that's in I the love, Renaissance. That's <laughs> very, huge. Mm. It's like you'll see a painting with you know, oh, I don't know, I'm thinking like Velasquez <coughs> or something. Different textures, bowls, plates, um, fruit, mm-hmm. rotting. You know, and the capacity to paint all these different textures. Yeah. That's like a painter saying, here I am, an announcement of my yes. skill. And, and so often that peeled orange or a peeled lemon, because that was apparently very hard to do because it would, 
we, obviously there was no access to a, to yeah. a camera, but they would sh they do shrivel up fast. Even just trying to shoot them, they just contract like this. So it is a real flex to do the the the, the orange spiral and yeah, mm, which yeah. is what that there's a painting in the show. Um, the artist flexes his muscle, which is all about <laughs> that kind of you know precision painting. And, yes, mm. you probably developed a real appreciation for 17th century Dutch life, like still <laughs> yeah. life painters, and yeah. that how they would do exactly that. They'd be gathering together fruits from different seasons yeah. and yeah. trying to you know depict it. <laughs> oh gosh, time is flying. Um, <laughs> there's a few. So another um, theme we sort of probed in the session just before was this idea of. Um, behaving and becoming like someone else, but also something else. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I I think that through with that sort of last room in the exhibition, which is so much about these incredible still lives and just, you know, the lobster and just the way you've shaped everything into this, you know, Zavros world and, and reality. Um, do you find that a compelling way to think through art making, like the idea of metamorphosis or the capacity to transform into something so yeah. hyper realistic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pretty much just what you said. But also um, it's very self referential. I think you it's it's connects to portraiture in a sense that you you have this picture of this artist arranging these things in his house with his nice things. And mm -hmm. I think that that's part of that that lifestyle portraiture sort of yeah. ho home and home and art art imitating life yeah. thing that has started to become central to the yeah. practice. Fantastic. Um, I want to make sure we, I mean, <clears throat> this technically to me is so striking given, I mean, we've been looking at a lot of 18th century portraits um, and thinking through just the capacity for artists to yeah, show shiny different interior textures, mm -hmm. dresses, just the, the capacity for cloth to, to become a character mm -hmm. in a painting. And I think I see that with the some of the portraits of your children. Um, but this one, all I can think is the reflections in the weights, like of the interior. I mean, I think, is this Versailles? I think yeah. it is. Yeah, so that's the Palace of Versailles. Yeah, and just how perfect that is in mm. terms of those reflections shining on the weights that are magically present in, yeah. and you're a magician here. Because well, I, I worked <laughs> with this this very clever magician. This is 2009, and um, obviously computer animation and you know working in the programs that he he worked in is this this 3D guru. They have changed enormously, but back then it felt like magic to us. And he he uh, we started with that 50s coffee table image which is the background right. image and he was able to manipulate the lighting and the the camera lens that was used his program told him that his program told him that the height of the photographer all of these things that he was able to then mimic when we built this gym in this in this space and um he'd send me a program that, so I could look down on the hall and move these things around and they were different colors so I could, color so I could put different weights on and, yeah. and sort of you know, compose this image. And, and then he, um, we had to obviously, because the, I've got these, this chrome mirror dumbbells you know, that set up this eternal reflection between the, the mirrors of the hall and the weights, um, we had to find all the images that they would reflect outside the window or from our vantage where we were looking or from anywhere to, to then feed into this enormous program and then it would render this image overnight. It would take that long. Um, and then he'd add shadows and dust and scratches and all of these other tweaky things. So that took about six weeks and then, and then obviously it, it became a painting which was a, a very big process but that's, that's also early collaboration for me and mm. stretching that that creative moment, you know, longer and longer. Something else we've been talking about with portraiture is the number of times that the subject has to sit for the artist <laughs> and, you know, all this testimony from the 18th, like, Aang was, like, bursting into tears because he can't get the person <laughs> in the right position and he would usually take about 30 sittings mm. with his... Um, you know, so I was just thinking about that in terms of like the durational element here and, you know, more specifically, I suppose to, well, portraiture that involves others. Mm 
um, your process there and how long it takes to get it right. Yeah. And I know it probably varies from image to image, but it, it, it does, and, and child to child. But and um, child to child, <laughs> yes, as we so Phoebe know, was they a great, are. Phoebe was they a don't supermodel. Sit. She was really great. She, yeah. um, they were often long and difficult sessions. Um, I mean, we have a camera. It's it's so much <laughs> easier than you know hundreds of years ago. But it's true. Um, but but it's um, Phoebe. Phoebe could just find the light, and she knew what she knew. Just how to turn. She sort of figured things out. Yeah, she was just mm. this kid that just really loved loved doing it. And, um, but but Leo, not so much. He's really he's amazing as a model, and the yeah. camera likes him. Yeah. But he he just gets sick of it very quickly and starts to cry and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> is this Phoebe here? This is this is Phoebe. Yeah, What's so. brilliant here too is so think of all the portraits we look at. I suppose with the exception of the Archimboldo, which is a face made of fruits and vegetables, mm-hmm. basically. But like here, personality is shining through without yes. the facial expressions. Yes. You know. Yes. And that idea of behave and become like something else. It's almost yep. like the cloth here is personifying. You know, becoming yes. who they are. Or, Absolutely. That that yeah. obfuscation. Yeah. It, it seems to both, you know, cover and protect something as well as draw attention to a thing. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's fascinating. But And then, you know, the idea of, so again, Phoebe, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, we've spent time looking at folds. <laughs> Art historians love drapery. We're like, yes. oh, the drapery is yeah. blue, you know. And I suppose a whole history of drapery, you could start that with Greek statuary yeah. and move right through. And... Um, I mean, to me, what's evocative here, just the different, the textures mm. that we see present on the, it's an autumn that she's sitting on and then yep. the folds of the dress. And so this fits in perfectly with mm-hmm. a lot of the elements of what we were talking about before. And then of course, in the back, there's sort of a, a Greek pedestal. And I think I want it, cause I think we need to give our audience time for questions mm-hmm. soon ish. I, I could talk to you all day, but anyway, <laughs> um, uh, that idea of, because something else I addressed in the talk was sort of the idea of Greek, uh, the idea of identity and mm-hmm. migrant identity. And a lot of the portraits I showed were actually people who were moved into different contexts, like a Spanish noblewoman who's in um, Florence or Albrecht Durer who travels to Italy and is marveling at what artists are treated like there versus yep. in in German the German lands. Mm-hmm. And I think... For me, what's coming through in the show more so than any other time I've seen your work is that uh, that exploration of, I suppose, and you know, with your giant Acropolis now, mm-hmm. um, the identity, the mm-hmm. I, the idea of you as a first generation. I think you're first generation yeah. Australian. So, how do you like? Is that something that you're consciously? Yeah, very yeah. much. It's um, it sort of crept into my practice in lots yeah. of ways. You know, you look at the, some mythology or. Um, Narcissus stuff, but then obviously something like um, that that painting of Phoebe, just yeah. just simple symbols that I, yeah. I think are nice traces in, in works. Yeah. Um, but I was looking, I'd, I'd, I'd spent a lot of time in the Met when I made this, come, come home from the States and made this work, and, and you were looking at Singer Sargent, I think, earlier, yeah, and, yeah. and um, this work is very inspired by by, by his work, and yeah. I mean, it's the works that I make with Phoebe now, I, I often wonder if they're coming to an end because she doesn't have a lot of time and she, right. she's often not inclined. Um, she's like, go away, Dad. She's go away. Like, but, <laughs> then, but then interesting things happen. So still mm. once a year we seem to do some sort of a project. But this one this one day Phoebe came out wearing Alison's wedding dress. You know, it's yeah. incredibly loaded, you know, your, your daughter's in your wife's wedding dress. And mm-hmm. it's not a white wedding dress. It's this sort of ice blue. Um, and I thought, wow, like like most of the things I do with the kids, I think, well, I don't know what to do with this, so I just need to paint it. But I just, and then at the same time, I thought I, I'm looking at these swathes of satin and I'm thinking of, of, of Singer Sargent and how he painted these society paintings and this yeah. kind of, this girl that's somehow now got a profile because of what I've done to her. Um, and how does all of this fit together? And can I can I reference all of this somehow? And so we we do a shoot, and sometimes shoots don't go anywhere. Yeah. You know, I, I convince her to sit for a little while, and and it's and then it's often in the editing process. I'm looking mm-hmm. at lots and lots of images, and there will just be this frame where Phoebe's had enough. Like this is that frame. Like she's starting to frown, and she's like, the, and and for whatever reason, it, it becomes. Expression. It's not something that's intentional in in the shoot, but 
in that editing process is such a live creative process too and it's like oh I think that's that's interesting that's where this starts to take a different turn but and in portraiture mm. it's so often about these little details very little things the one of um, the homework I mean that's all about her having the one braid held I don't know that little yeah. sort of detail in there well um, well that's Olympia who doesn't doesn't appear in Olympia. many things so okay Olympia doesn't love the camera. Yeah. The camera doesn't love her. So she's she's <laughs> not very comfortable in 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 this role. Um and and that day, you know, I was doing this project with Rolls-Royce and I said, "Oh, I think I want to shoot these kids in this car and like as if it's their everyday, you know, life, it's yeah. lifestyle." <laughs> these <laughs> these felt pens sort of dangerously strewn across this cream <laughs> leather and, and and Phoebe just goes straight into acting mode and she's like, yeah. okay, Dad, I'm going to do my homework and she's turning pages and she's looking out the window and she's thinking and she's doing all this stuff. Whereas <laughs> Olivia, she's just looking at the camera like this. I'm like, no, Olivia, you can't look at the camera. So she looked down like this and then look out the window. <laughs> so we, we, we froze Olympia doing this. She's just frozen. So yeah. imagine 120 photographs where Olympia is just... <laughs> Exactly doing that That's in excellent. every single one, and Phoebe's doing something different. <laughs> and the girls are just chalk and cheese, you know, and they're, they're almost twinning in this picture. There's two years between them, but um, that's yeah. that's such a compelling detail in this in mm. this image. Do they have the sense of the Greek identity? I was just thinking about um, how that sometimes can pass on to the next generation, but not like a, yeah. um, probably more so even than I did because my dad yeah. has remarried Greek and so he, the kids spend a lot of time with him. He speaks to them in Greek. We have, we cook Greek now. We do more Greek yeah. things than, than I did when I was growing up. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, they, they like it. I love that you said that you spent time at the Met looking at these works and Sargent really speaks to you and matters and mm. art historians love when artists say that. Yeah. <laughs> sort of, you know, that, that looking... Um, has inspired your practice mm. in a way. And I remember when the Met show was here and we spent a lot of time looking at the Caravaggio painting, yes. the musicians, and thinking about technique in there. Mm -hmm. And is that, I mean, I know, so obviously they didn't have, but do those do those old masters inspire you Absolutely. in terms of like, Absolutely. your practice? Yeah, um, often some, <clears throat> excuse me, some trip will just, you know, bring enormous shifts to my practice. And mm. I'll think, you know, what I'm making isn't stacking up or it's a bit anemic or mm. this painting is just glowing after hundreds hundreds of years and how has this artist done this? And so in, in just simple technical research, yes. I start to sort of wind back and think, how do I do things? So Bad Dad was one of those where I literally came home after looking at um, the, that Caravaggio's Narcissus, the, yeah. the Barberini, and I thought, gosh, I just everything about that composition I, I want to pay homage to, not reference, but I guess pay homage to more. Um, but also technically I just wanted to really ramp things up and how do I get brighter colours and better light. And so you all, started all this in Rome? No, I, 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 it came from a residency in, in Rome in 2012 okay. and then I painted it actually for the Archibald 2013. Yeah. <laughs> You'll win it, Michael. I'm so glad You'll I didn't win it though. Like this, <laughs> this painting had a much better life than if it had won the Archibald. This, I unabashedly say, I mean, this is absolutely one of my favourite works in, oh, in our collection. I adore this painting. I think it was on the cover of a novel by, um, oh gosh... Who's um, the, you know, the guy who wrote The Slap? Christos Scholkas. Isn't yeah, it yeah. on he, the cover? He, uh, it's, he, it was it illustrated mistaken? one of his projects for yeah. um, the Venice Biennale ar architecture yeah. thing, I think. Yeah. Okay. Now we're, okay, now it's time for you. <laughs> I, I mean, I have many more things to add. But anyway, we'd love to have some audience questions. Georgina's really, really ready over there. <laughs> that shut up fast. <laughs> She's the happiest okay. audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's so great to listen. It's wonderful. Um, I was loving hearing about Echo and your process of creating that work mm -hmm. um, where you're working with 3D imaging to help you compose the image that you wanted to create. And obviously with your work, there's always this intersection between traditional and contemporary and, and cutting edge technologies. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you are yet exploring or starting to think about exploring using AI as a collaborative tool for future work? Mm -hmm. um, I, I've only had a mess around with ChatGPT and thought, wow, that's amazing. And um, I'm, seeing, 
I'm seeing things come through social media that people are asking some AI to spit out and they're, they're very impressive. Um, and so much of my work is about death of the author, you know, or, or not so much of it, but I'm just, yeah. I just play with the, these ideas a lot. But I, I worry AI is really truly the death of the author, you know. It's, <laughs> it's this thing can just mine my work or anyone's, anyone's anything um, to come up with. And, and, and on the one hand, that's, that's incredibly wonderful and, and fantastic. Um, but it, it does worry me a little bit. I'm not sure what to make of... But imagine if your dad mannequin started to paint, you know? <laughs> and that would be amazing. So, like, it just, I don't know. Something I, that, you know, that could be cool. Could have, you know. Anyway, great question. Any it's other questions cool. for Michael while he's here? We're so lucky he's here. <laughs> <laughs> I can stay. Thank you, Michael. I think your work's incredible. Thank you. Um, with the bad dad and then with dad the mannequin, mm -hmm. which, if you had your time again, which would you do first? <laughs> oh, um, I, I don't think I could do them in different times than, than mm -hmm. at the time that they were made. Um, I mean, the, the, the mannequin work, I, I wouldn't have probably made it if, if COVID hadn't happened mm. and, and a bunch of shows fell through and, and it was a response to having more time and having, having that opportunity to, to take a risk, I suppose, in my practice in a new way. And, um, but also just that thinking time and mm. time to reflect on my own life and, um, I don't know, these, these different modes <laughs> in, in my life. So I, I don't mm. know that they could have happened in different succession. And can I just ask... Yeah. In your early work with the um, small, the miniatures of the suits and so on, mm -hmm. when I look at those paintings, I just think it's almost as though, am I wrong in, wrong in thinking this, that in painting those little miniatures, it's almost as though you wish that, suing, that suit that you wore to your wedding into being. That there's almost like a sense of, you know, wish or fulfilment yes. with your work. No, no, you're, you're completely right. Um, and those works were... Um, I was really coveting something mm. and, and we don't really talk about that at the time. It wasn't mm. the sort of things that artists would say, but it, looking at them now and work that came much later, they were very aspirational things and very affirmative things. So I'm saying, you know, I like this and I want this. Mm. Um, and s so often, you, you know, I can make that glib joke, I suppose, that, you know, paintings of suits begat the suit mm. and, and on it went. Um, and I started to roll that into my practice and make that the practice almost itself. But it was very, I was very outward looking, trying to do that. And then it sort of shifted and I started to document my own life. Okay, mm. thank you. Thanks a lot. Mm. Other questions? In the back? I think it's Grace. <laughs> I can't see very well here. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, hi, it's Grace from Australian Art. Um, hi, I just wanted to um, ask you um, whether you imagine having works in the future that will have um, either both photographs that will have yourself and a mannequin in it. Um, for the Sullivan Strumpf um, exhibition, there were those incredible videos done where you could see the mm -hmm. mannequin, say, um, with your family at the table and we could see you in the in the background and mm. um, in the publication we get you know mm. wonderful in progress shots of you know seeing you you know posing the mannequin with your family so I wonder mm. whether you would ever imagine having you and the mannequin in a work together oh yeah. nice a double portrait no, no. <laughs> yes um, <laughs> there's I, I, Renaissance conventions yeah, for that <laughs> I, I think that I think that would would be interesting um, Th those videos that Sullivan and Strumpf made, and they were they're really good at promoting things. That, yeah. that gallery, <laughs> they had this this guy Dave who was um, making films for artists to go straight onto Instagram. So that's where those two different films came from. Um, and I think Robert says in his in his essay that he he thinks that's the best work that came from from mm. the whole thing is with the, those films. But um, yeah, I kind of have kept us separate. He looks a lot better than me, and so <laughs> I, I kind of. <laughs> I try not to stand next to him. He's not. I don't bring him into the show. He's. he's, he's you didn't he bring stay, him along. He can stay in the. In the What's he in doing the, now? <laughs> Where is he? He's just Are looking out the window. Care of <laughs> he gets a bit too much sun at the moment. I need to. I need to move him. <laughs> I love the idea of 
do you have a double portion? Hey, it's you heard it here first, out. folks. <laughs> I, I'm used to him. He really freaks people out. <laughs> Other oh, question. I have to. Can I? I have to add in one small thing. Mm. So, yesterday we were playing phone tag a bit to yes. just catch up before the show. And when M- Michael called, I looked. It's Michael. And I, at the moment you called, <laughs> I was watching a video of you because I was sort of catching up on the interviews that had happened. Mm-hmm. And in the video, you were talking about the mannequin. So it was this meta moment. Oh. Like Michael's on the phone. <laughs> he's on my screen. It was like how many Michaels there? Anyway, too many. I was just <laughs> Anyway, okay, <laughs> other questions? Mm. Yes. Um, I was just wondering about the future of the Mercedes with the water in it. <laughs> I, I'm wondering about that too, actually. <laughs> I can tell you it's not going to hit the road again, that, that, that car. It is, it is, um, it is retired. Um, it, it is, a, it is yeah. a contemporary ruin. But um, I, I'm not sure. So we... So I bought this car and we've spent quite a lot of fabricating it to look like I didn't do anything to it except just fill mm. it up with water. But it has, water does pose crazy problems, you know, just a body of water sitting there. It finds a way into things that you don't expect it to, even right. when you've made a, made a fiberglass spa bath mm. and put this whole thing back together and remade a lot of it um, to look like the original. But Water finds a way, and I was looking at it last night, and there are new things that the water is doing. Oh, <laughs> so co- conservation every week here are are in touch with the fabricator, saying, "Okay, this is what it's doing now." Um, Does so, Quagoma own it now? No, it? no, no. It's yours. It's, it's it, for now. It's mine, but um, <laughs> <laughs> conservation's going to be difficult. Yeah. yeah. So not sure what's going to happen afterwards. I've got. I do have a show like this in New Zealand. Uh, Next end of next year, I, I, I think the date's not not quite fixed yet. So, it might go there next after it's dried out for a little while. <laughs> hoping hoping that's going to happen. I think the dad mannequin wants to dry it. <laughs> yeah, he's the only one that can now. <laughs> he has lower expectations. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Oh, hi, Michael. So, like. Hi. At an earlier session, we talked about uh, Renaissance paintings, about like artists gonna like elevate themselves to represent wealth. Mm-hmm. And after each of your like painting and self portraits, do you think you're representing like you want to see your vision of yourself or t- present to others, or like do you actually feel like you've become something new? Oh. Um, that's that's a good question. So I, I guess a lot of my portraits, I don't really feel are. Classical portraits, in so far as they're they're somewhere between figure painting and portraiture, and whether it's myself or the kids, there's an element of role play where it's not really a portrait. It's it's let's make a painting about mm. this, um, and while it might be a good likeness, it's it, it maybe isn't telling you an accurate account of something, but it also is. So it's this kind of um, it's this. It's a bit like Instagram, I suppose. It's this projection of of, of a, a kind of a fiction about y- your life or about mm-hmm. anything. It's it's not it's not quite a true account, and I I, I quite like that. Um, that that's what I'm I'm seeking to to do with those. It's interesting, also, this idea of um, like role play. So we talked about Sergeant's Madame X and. I mentioned like Nicole Kidman at one point dressed up as Madame X, this very, and then during the pandemic, there was this surge of people dressing up as paintings, in fact. Yeah. So that idea of, or like if you think of Tableau Vivant, so in the 19th century, they'd play games. Mm-hmm. The parlor game was, let's get together and, and enact a painting. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I think about this, I know, I, I just, I, I think what you just said is very evocative because it's mm-hmm. about, you know, Contrasting the idea of the portrait as a likeness, or the portrait as almost staging, or yeah. like theatre in a yeah, way. Yeah, theatre, yeah. but also acknowledging this strange lens through which we now see ourselves, yes. and that I see my family, or that others maybe do, and yes. I'm kind of interested in documenting and manipulating that. Yes, yes. Hmm. Good questions, everybody. <laughs> Great art history. This might be our last one. Okay. Last question. Sorry. No pressure. Hi Michael, it's Robin speaking. Look, I'm just wondering, you were saying that with the 
evolution of your painting going from your beautiful suits right through to your bad dad and your, your family portraits and those. With the new um, aspirations, I guess, in society changing where, you know, 15, 20 years ago everybody loved Hugo Boss and all of those yeah. sorts of things and that there were different aspirations. Now the generations are a little bit more um, woke, I guess you'd say, and they're, mm. they're not so celebratory of these mm. sort of icons. Is it going to change your um, direction of your art? Because you really do celebrate beauty and um, opulence and just aspirations, I think, in, in that way. But has that anti-establishment sort of affected you and the way that you want to progress in the future, do you think? Uh, it's... I don't think so. I think that um, I, I'm always responding to what's what's around me, I suppose, yeah. and um, observing m my life and, and, you know, what I see out of these eyes, I guess. So it, it, it can't not, um, no. uh, um, you know, enter my, my mind, my practice somehow. Mm. But I would say, too, that so often... You know, right back to those suit works we were talking about and everything that I, I've made work about, including now, so much of my practice runs against the grain of, of, of contemporary practice. It, yeah. it is, it is, mm. I'm famously don't do the things artists do or make the things artists make or say the things in my work that, that other artists tend to say. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm often criticised for it or, or celebrated for it. Uh, it's just... I can only make the thing that is relevant to me. But I think running against the grain of practice has often been good good for my practice. Even, even simple things like painting in 99, 2000, you know, coming out of a, t a time of installation art and almost straight into photography and film, the, f the first decade of, of, of the 2000s, no one was really painting or figure yeah. painting or... or paintings from GQ on a miniature scale that there were very they were unusual things to be doing but just felt like you know, what I wanted to do there's an exhibition on right now at the UQ Art Museum and um, I was going through with a friend and there was a row of paintings by Chris Bassey of shells and we were both from, wow look a row of paintings it's so yeah. great to see you paint you know yeah um so I take your point completely it's sort of like you know, the death of painting has been predicted over and over again. Mm. Well, it's not dead, is no, it? So there we go. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, so much for your questions. And thank you for your attention. And let's thank Michael. Michael, we thank cannot you. let two years pass no. again. <laughs>